Hello everyone, today we talk about Roman Egypt, the boundaries of this region uh, linked to the geographical location uh, of the territory remain almost unchanged uh, during uh, its millenary history. Right? There is a very specific uh, say, boundary uh, to it. Uh, Egypt extended from the Mediterranean coast in the north to the first cataract of the Nile, basically near Elephantine, uh, close to, to Aswan, uh, in the south. The Nile continues, right? Uh, but at the southern border you have uh, Nubia, right? And this boundary is definitely more fluid because it was uh, decentralized essentially for both countries uh, and it remained a sort of, of a frontier. And to the northeast, the border between Egypt and the Arabian Desert, right, uh, corresponding essentially to the line between uh, the current Gulf of Suez, uh, that was actually in Ptolemaic times already, you know, opened. At least uh, there was another channel that worked, right, uh, and was basically went in ruin uh, at the end of antiquity, uh, and uh, Rhinoculura is located uh, in the north on the Mediterranean coast. That's basically the, uh, the line. To the west you have easily the Libyan desert, marking even here an indeterminate limit, but as far as probably the desert is concerned, uh, you don't find too much uh, out there. There are, yes, there is uh, ammonium, there are some oases, whatever, they're heavily uh, say influenced by um, Egyptian culture. But there is also the Berber world um, that was very limited uh, in potential, as we were talking about just the other day, about um, uh, the, the Mauritanian Limes or the Cyrenaican one, right? So it hadn't been historical much uh, concern. Then you have Paritonian on the coast uh, that uh, that is basically like imagine in a, more or less at, at, in, at the midst of Libya's uh, longitude uh, on the coast, and this can be considered the entrance to Egypt. But aside from this coastal center, there is really nothing much uh, in uh, in in between. Uh, we've seen that Cyrenaica pertains to kind of another uh, sphere but it's also very uh, Egyptian influence. Then, everything revolves, uh, as you know, in Egypt uh, around the Nile, right? The, the great river that crosses the territory that made it, basically. Um, and that was the source of great wealth for the land of the pharaohs, right? The Egyptian civilization, just like the Mesopotamian one, owes to this unspeakable uh, amount of agricultural output. To, to the fertility of the soil, in this case just next door to, to the desert, right? Um, and that is capable of supporting such millinery civilization. Uh, the narrow strip of land, um, hundreds of kilometers long across by the, the Nile, uh, was rendered that fertile by the floods uh, of, of the river. Uh, however, Egypt was also rich in mineral resources, right? There are, there are mountains between, uh, between Egypt and, and the Red Sea. There are um, some resources also scattered in, um, in the dependencies of Egypt, that we will see now. Um, and after the victory of, uh, over the Achaemenids in 333 BC, the conquest of Tyre the following year, Alexander the Megas, reached and liberated Egypt from Persian rule to 331 BC dates back to the foundation of Alexandria, right? The most important one of the, I think, 13, 14 that were founded by, uh, by the, the Macedonian king across basically what had been the entire Achaemenid space. Um, and this Hellenistic legacy is definitely the one that the Romans um, come to deal with, uh, aside from the naturally massive Egyptian uh, Kamenic Sostratum, that remains uh, canonically very, very 
present in Egypt, right? The same Roman emperors, as we were, we were often remember, were depicted as pharaohs in the same uh, traditional style of the Egyptian sacred, and thus only art. Um, so after Alexander's death in 323, Ptolemy, the son of Lagos, hence the term also Lagid or Lagid dynasty, uh, dynasty for for the Ptolemies, ruled uh, Egypt first as a satrap, right? So a governor, just like in the uh, in the provincial guise of the Achaemenid Empire, and from 306 305 BC as an actual king, right? So the the, the title of pharaoh naturally was bestowed to all these. Um, uh, rulers from there on. Um, the um, Heleno Macedonian Ptolemaic dynasty ruled Egypt until 30 BC, right? So the year just after Actium, the basically the removal of the last uh, successors, like uh, of of the Ptolemaic dynasty, um, and uh, naturally also for later. Uh, Roman history in the region, this this legacy left up a profound mark uh, in, in Egypt. And if the literary sources allow us to reconstruct Egyptian history, uh, both in Ptolemaic and, and Roman periods, pretty well, um, the very rich papyrus documentation offers also a, this vast knowledge of the internal mechanisms. Uh, of the kingdom, right? institutionally, social, socially, economically, um, in this time, in this Hellenic Roman uh, period. Right? So we are lucky compared to, to other uh, provinces because naturally the, the level of civilizational development had been immense. You can't, you can't say that Egypt actually was the single most advanced uh, power among the, uh, the major ones of the Diadochoi. As a matter of fact, it was a pretty messed up country uh, in many ways. It was very difficult to control because it was huge and it had always this massive amount of people that had to be controlled in a way or another. I made a video, by the way, about the Ptolemaic army organization. We will come back uh, looking at it. We've seen how uh, interesting the kind of the intersection between the rulers, um, the foreign rulers, uh, other uh, in fact, external ethnic elements were coming to be hired and so on, have been stationed, garrisoned there, and the locals, yes, right. Uh, Egypt, uh, differently from, uh, at least before the Roman, uh, in terms of time before the Roman conquest, compared to the Seleucid uh, Empire, the Antigonic Kingdom, was the one that could afford the least the traditional Macedonian phalangitic system, that caused an enormity. Uh, I also made lots of videos about this topic, um, and we will keep talking about it in, in the future. Um, so you understand how soft right, this really was, and uh, as overbearingly rich. So in many ways, the Romans had been eyeing um, the Ptolemaic kingdom from, from quite an early uh, time. All right, and it represents a bit... Uh, archetypically, the uh, crowning of the probably the concepts of the northern um, predatory um, European conqueror seizing this essentially female soft, uh, you know, uh, southern hot kind of decadent system, and almost like you know the Roman eagle penetrating the the Egyptian delta as if it was. Uh, a vagina. There was a lot of of that symbolism uh, in that Egypt crowned the reaffirmation of the golden age on Earth, right? As with the end of the civil war between the the chosen people of Rome, uh, so the the greatest crowning, right? Of the greatest reign, right? The one in which, debatably, say at least Alexander had left his greatest legacy, if anything, because he was buried there. Notoriously, the first thing. Augustus does when he steps, uh, I mean, still Octavian at the time, when he steps in Egypt, is he visits um, Alexander's sarcophagus, right? But Egypt is also uh, an open world to very far away places, 
right? Octavian also wants to see and to bring back to Rome some Nicene horses that, as we've seen in the videos about uh, Central Asian warfare, were the properly the heavenly horses, the ones um, sweating blood, right? The best war uh, horses uh, uh, in in mankind historically, and this could be accessed even in Egypt, so of course the contact with the East, through the Red Sea, with China. We'll make a video about that, right? There was a Templum Augusti in Malabar, right? And uh, from that, that uh, the route was quite important because um, uh, the, the Parthians were already uh, in between, right in the Middle East, um, kind of sucking away resources from the uh, Roman Chinese intercontinental trade. So Egypt um, and the Red Sea ports, we will see now, acquired a, a massive relevance. So, and it's difficult to just condensate in such a short amount of, of time, like the properly the fastige connected with the, the conquest of this land. There was a great civilization long before Rome, and that was captured properly and old and um, you know and becoming the the most manifest um, uh, uh, evidence of divine power on earth um, from from Rome now um, Ptolemaic Egypt appears as we were saying before as objectively a multicultural multilingual uh, system right uh, there were different peoples like just leaving think about the Atlantic uh, conquerors, the local Egyptians, um, just speaking about the, the two largest ethnic groups, but where again immigrants from the eastern Mediterranean, especially Jews, uh, converging to the country, concentrated mainly in, an, in Alexandria. Famously enough, Jewish presence was throughout all the Levant quite, quite consistent. Um, the uh, first relations between Rome and the Lagid dynasty date back to the 3rd century BC, right? As early as following the Roman success over Pyrrhus uh, in Italy in 273 BC, Ptolemy II Philadelphus sent an embassy to Rome to congratulate her with with the with the victory and the the friendships that um, were established in this circumstance between the Roman and the Ptolemaic governments were meaningfully and initially set up on a level of political and juridical equality. In other words, the pharaohs of Egypt were recognizing the Senate and the people of Rome as their own peers. Um, this was of massive resonance all over the Mediterranean, all over the Hellenistic world. Um, consider at this point um, uh, the various peoples had been realizing that the threat right, that Rome would have posed would have been expanding um, in, in, in essentially in, in the Atlantic space in southern Italy. They had to cope with the Carthaginians, but you know that the Macedonians began immediately to. Uh, to support uh, the, uh, the the Punic uh, Republic, uh, eventually, like the the same Seleucids stepped into Greece when the Romans did, um, and the latter were enemies of of Egypt uh, historically. With the endless um, Syrian wars, we will talk about uh, later because that's also how the Romans began to infiltrate in, in Egypt in the first place as protectors, as as always. Um, in, in, in form. Um, uh, Egypt, however, remained neutral during the First and the Second Punic Wars, also because, you know, it, it was just like a too, too much uh, of a distant theater to be just uh, sensible to, to intervene, right, it, given the pretty wreck, uh, sorry status of the uh, Ptolemaic finances that grew massively indebted eventually towards the same Rome because of this constant wars with the Seleucids. Um, in fact, the uh, either two sporadic contacts with Rome intensified during the second century BC um, when Rome has taken off. Um, and so the events connected to the Sixth Syriac War, so this conflict between Egypt and and the Seleucids from the 3rd century BC um, that 
nobody was winning, or at least almost at the end the Seleucids were actually winning if Rome didn't step in, in, in the way. But allowed, in fact, uh, the Capitoline city to strengthen her diplomatic role in the Levant. Now, the war fought for essentially the possession of Koile Syria, right? Um, and mostly a struggle on essentially the, the same Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, uh, and seeing essentially the, you know, alternate um, phases, telling the truth, depending on the, on the rulers, on the, on the, on the battles and so on. But, um, brought, um, and especially the, the, the sixth one, the one from 180 to 167, on two occasions, the occupation of large part of Egypt itself by Antiochus IV, the Seleucid emperor, who entered um, Egypt just for this broader historical, political um, uh, conflict, uh, that was also dynastic, however, in nature, right? The sense was that, of course, they married into each other at some point, and so they tried to make this, um, let's say, the, the dynastic right of succession uh, a viable way, especially in front of these peoples, like the the Syrian, the Semites, the, 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 the Egyptians, and so on. It were habituated, basically, to this kind of greater rulers, like kings of kings, the... You know the, the the great the pharaohs, um, etc. Um, to say make the thing work, they had been properly um, the we can't even say demilitarized, especially in Egypt. The Machimoi are famous um, for exactly for the fact that they were enlisted in the end, but were surely much more um, subjects than, of course, what you could see in in Europe, right? Uh, and this is typical of the, uh, the Hellenistic uh, powers, especially in this area. Now, the legate, the, there is this episode, the famous, the, the day of Eleusis, that is one of the most meaningful and eloquent uh, in showing how far Roman power had gotten even uh, over the, the Hellenistic powers, uh, occurred during the siege of Alexandria, when the Romans sent a legation, headed by Caius Popilius Lenas, inducing the Seleucid monarch to immediately implement the provisions of the Roman Senate and to leave Egypt entirely, right? But what basically the Roman ambassador that was asking Antiochus to, to, to move, because Rome was asking that, and he began to, like, say, well, see what to do. And, and the ambassador drew a circle around the monarch and said, you know, the moment you step out of this, you, um, you must have, you must give the answer, right? And that was a pretty uh, uh, useful, say, you know, example of what, again, what the, the Seleucids could expect, um, considered this was after the Battle of Magnesia, so the, the collapse, actually, of, of Syrian power to something, in fact, much more uh, regionally based than the actual empire that, as you know, at some point stretched from, from Attica, literally after Antiochus III invasion of Greece, to, to Afghanistan, right, and to the Indus at some point. So um, Rome had already significantly crippled the power and uh, could simply dictate this uh, orders, nothing less than that. Now, dynastic conflicts in Egypt spanned the next two decades, right, and see the growing influence of Rome in foreign, but also in domestic policy. In fact, the Lagged monarchy uh, is weakened at this time. Uh, massively indebted. The country, as we'll see now, is basically falling apart. Even within the same Ptolemaic dynasty, there are some chunks ruled by uh, an, in uh, an individual, a relative, uh, one by another, and so on. So, uh, 
This was very useful for Rome, that could simply strengthen her hegemonic position in the Mediterranean, not that the Ptolemies would have ever challenged her um, in this at, at that point, but especially for accessing, as it will remain, as you know, a light motive until the, um, the Islamic conquest, the, the massive uh, import of grains um, from, from this brutally fertile Nile Valley, to Rome for feeding the mob and also many of the other cities uh, in the Mediterranean. Now, Scipio Aemilianus uh, visited Egypt in 140-139 BC during a diplomatic mission in the Levant, right? Uh, the guy was, was a hero, uh, as you know, uh, and, you know, the, the, the spirit was always, especially as far as the, the Corneli were involved in this kind of more Hellenistic um, interest and kind of almost monarchic mimicking that in Rome was naturally looked upon uh, with great suspicion. Um, so being peers again with this other great uh, divine rulers, you know, were another, that was mostly about uh, the you know, the res publica populi romani, but that also these uh, individuals as imperium holders naturally could uh, could rise to personally. Um, think about Scipio Africanus that had allegedly gone to Antioch where he met both with Antiochus III and Hannibal, according to the story. Um, this was not the first time. Now, the sources insist on the occasion of the Aemilianus uh, visit uh, on the luxury of the court of Ptolemy VIII, Evergetus II, uh, nicknamed Fiscon, that is to say Fatty, uh, interestingly enough, um, but also underlined that the stay in Egypt uh, of Scipio allowed the Roman legates to evaluate the strategic position of Alexandria and the richness of the Egyptian territory. Um, in other words, the Romans were making a bit of reconnaissance as far as they would have literally gone boots on the ground and taking more direct control of the situation. Because, uh, again, as far as the fluctuations of the Egypt uh, Egyptian grain were concerned, well, uh, Rome was um, affected by it and uh, the, the Senate needed to stabilize the situation, well, bling, you know, uh, conflicts, revolts, possible disturbances that could interfere with that shipping. Um, the Roman mission did not preclude, by the way, uh, the, the same possible annexation, right? The, the Romans, again, but by that point had uh, lost any sense of, you know, like, uh, of inhibition towards these Hellenistic powers. Um, and it, it seems, um, by the way, that the, the same mission allowed Scipio Aemilianus to establish personal clientary relationships in Egypt. And this, this is witnessed by interesting uh, sources. For example, inscriptions testify the presence of Romans, um, and probably also Italians as such, right, as uh, not just Romans, uh, f full Roman citizens uh, in Egypt, as early as the end of the second century BC. I, I want to make a video, by the way, also about actually the presence of Italic mercenaries uh, in uh, in Egypt at some point. We've seen in the video about the Ptolemaic army that there, there was an Italic guy there uh, among the, probably in the phalanx. So uh, surely the land was not uh, strange to, um, you know, external uh, infiltration and just, you know, mercantile uh, uh, activity uh, from abroad and so on. Um, the first inscription, the oldest one, dating from 116 BC, comes from Philae. And this is basically... Um, a dedication to Apollo in honor of one of Ptolemy VIII's generals referring to 127-126 BC placed in Delos by Roman but again very probably uh, Italian merchants and ship owners present or resident in Alexandria in this period. 
Right, this is particularly important because if you look also at the series about the Italian maritime republics and so on, you realize that, I don't know, the, the Venetians or rather had been there from ever. Like the concept that from the Italian peninsula um, goods were traded, again, with, with Egypt is going is dating back to in, in the millennia. Uh, then there, there is a papyrus documenting the lavish welcome given to the uh, senator Lucius Manius uh, on an unofficial visit, by the way, as a, as a not as a private, but still not being, you know, uh, simply uh, being issued, being ordered by the Senate to Egypt in uh, 112 BC. By the way, this happened one year before the outbreak of the war against Jugurtha in the media, so surely there was something going on in, you know, probably testing some sort of loyalty from Egypt, possi- you know, the, the testing the possibility of of getting some some support or something. Now, uh, Ptolemy the Eight, again, a virgin is the second, had been the first of the uh, Ptolemies. Um, to uh, have made already in the mid second century BC, specifically 155, a testament in favor of Rome, as we've seen uh, in other um, this was uh, in other videos, right? This was typical of some Hellenistic powers not knowing to boom give their their power and very often not to want to to give uh, say given that these countries were hopelessly indebted first of all and the romans were pressuring them um and mostly these dynasties were all at war with one another somebody said okay maybe i don't have a, a direct heir i leave this to rome because at least it will not go in the hands of those other uh, you know bastards and the concept uh is surprisingly similar to some feudal powers during the Middle Ages, right? When you say, but why did they install foreign dynasties when exactly because it was the locals who created the greatest problem and wanted to partition the kingdom and the power uh, on the basis of their own local oligarchies, right? Not maintaining it unitary. And surely the Ptolemies cared about actually the unity of, of Egypt. Uh, in that sense. So in a way, aside from the, the, the true and proper Roman extortions that occurred like with, with Pergamon, with other great Hellenistic powers, um, these donations reflect probably also the sense of, say, okay, maybe the country is is better uh, with Rome, uh, under Rome, than, than, under, than under us or whoever will follow me um, in the first place. Now, in 107 uh, BC, um, uh, uh, Ptolemy uh, the Eight died, and the kingdom, in fact, was split among his sons, um, because you know this initial donation was not uh, the integral of the kingdom; it just had something given to Rome. Now, at the end of the second century BC, after the dynastic struggles that followed, um, the situation was that fragmented. Ptolemy the Tenth Alexander the First ruled Egypt. Ptolemy the Ninth uh, Soter the Second, the island of Cyprus, and his illegitimate son Ptolemy Apion, Cyrenaica. We have seen it in the video about uh, Creta et Cyrenaica. Um, so you understand to the sorrow state to which uh, the, the the kingdom had uh, fallen, and what an opportunity this would make for Rome to exploit. The epigraphic law of Delphi and Cnidus, dating from the late 100 and the early 99 BC, defines the uh, uh, kings, respectively Egypt, Cyprus, and Cyrene, altogether as friends and associates of the Roman people, and they were required to cooperate and base themselves in the fight against piracy. You understand what, what this means, right? The Romans were practically recognizing these rulers, each, each one in their own, uh, say, in the provincial dimension that they had carved for themselves. Um, so it was securing, in part, their, their status um, and sort of freezing the situation to keep the country divided. And there was really no external threat, right, to, to take advantage of the situation, if not Rome herself. Um, and obliging these uh, 
Eastern Mediterranean powers to also provide uh, for the, the the struggle against piracy that, as you know, was becoming a problem. Um, also, because, by the way, the decline of, especially of, of the Seleucids, of the St. Ptolemies, um, and the fact that the Romans were often involved um, at this point in, the, in other theaters, uh, were not actually starting to fight against one another. Uh, and, and so at least given the coastal dimensions of these powers, there was some uh, naval force that could be put together, some, of course, uh, well, it was the, the locals' interest to defend um, the same land from incursions and so on. Um, there is a debate regarding the identity of the Egyptian king Alexa, which is mentioned as such by Kikaro in one of his scripts, um, who would have um, bequeathed his kingdom to the Romans. Uh, this is interesting, right? Some scholars think that um, this um, un unpublished will dates back to 88 BC and concerns Ptolemy the Tenth Alexander I, so as we said before, the guy that was ruling in Egypt proper from 107 to uh, 88 uh, BC. Uh, other scholars, however, refer it to Ptolemy the 11th Alexander II, who um, ruled on Egypt for only 19 days in 80 BC, uh, perhaps thanks to the intervention, by the way, of Sulla, to whom Ptolemy the Ninth Soter the Second, to whom Ptolemy the Ninth Soter in 86 BC had denied ships for war against Mithridates, and this aspect is fascinating because, as we've seen, the latter ruler um, was at the head of Cyprus, and so uh, the island was an important uh, logistical basis for the Roman legions operating in the east. So as a retaliation, uh, Sulla helped um, the, uh, you know, the, the, the rival uh, in Egypt uh, instead, who um, you know, was, was relieved at least by, by his uh, relative's pressure. The um, Egyptian question that was becoming ever more stringent, even because um, at least the Romans would have surely profited from a permanent occupation now of this mess that engulfed again trade, shipping, this other, the stability of, of the Eastern Mediterranean in the first place, um, entered in fact the the debate and the political struggle in Rome in the following decades. Uh, the riches of Egypt were a source of great attraction for a lot of uh, ambitious ruler. Uh, but above all, for the Equites, the Roman knights that, of course, were also connected with the, the great warlords who were emerging in Roman politics. In 65 BC, Marcus Licinius Crassus, uh, that was cancer at the time, had proposed um, the annexation of Egypt, but uh, he found strong opposition within the Senate. Um, as you understand, like, eventually Crassus would be connected with, with the East, um, you know, in his fortunes, and his misfortunes, actually, um, in, in Asia. Um, and the uh, diumviral uh, equilibrium instead would bring, unavoidably, Egypt either again, uh, from one side or the other. In the meanwhile, Ptolemy the Twelfth Neos Dionysos, the Auletas, the flute player, um, that was um, on the throne of Egypt, as Pharaoh from 50 BC, aimed to be recognized uh, as king also by Rome. The situation in Egypt um, was actually uh, falling apart. Right? Auletas counted above all on the support of Pompey at that point uh, to counter especially the attempts to uh, annex Egypt, promoted by the Popularis in Rome, so mostly Caesar's faction. So that he promised in 60 BC to pay 6,000 talents to both Caesar and Pompey, which was a clever move. In 59 BC, which was notoriously the year of Caesar's consulship, uh, Ptolemy Auletus was recognized as king, 
by means of a senatus consultum um, and with a lex uh, by which he was declared amicus et socius populi Romani. Right, so in other words, among uh, what uh, Caesar paid for becoming consul and eventually invading Gaul, there was also the crown of Ptolemy Aletus that was, uh, you know, standing against uh, essentially the popularist policy, and so in favor of, of Pompey. Um, after all, Caesar was not um, really uh, about Egypt now. He would have liked actually to, to conquer Dacia, right? He, he settled for Gaul, but it was all about, as you know, an uh, internal struggle uh, in Rome. Now, in 58 BC, the Auletes was forced to leave Egypt due to a revolt, right? F uh, following the Roman annexation of Cyprus, that we will see um, in the relative uh, provincial video. Um, and he reached Rome, and Pompey actually had him as a guest uh, for a while in his Villa Albana. Um, but this was surely a messed up situation. I mean, Egypt was left now in the hands of different people that were not part of the deal. So the situation was getting uh, heated consistently. Um, Pompey promoted the return of the Auletes to the throne, but the matter by this point ex uh, appeared extremely complicated. In 50 5 BC, Pompey, at the request uh, of the Auletes, solicited the um, military intervention of the Roman governor of Syria, that is Aulus Gabinius, who, for money, essentially brought uh, the Auletes back to the throne of Egypt by force of arms. Right, The Romans simply stepped in and they actually... Uh, left a garrison known as the Gabiniani uh, legionnaires um, in Egypt, while the uh, knight uh, Caius Rabirius Postumus, who had um, repeatedly financed the Auletes, was appointed as Dioicetes, which in this Hellenistic um, administration title stands for Minister of Finances. Right? So it was a way to um, uh, take also direct control of the vast um, riches uh, of the country. Now, this was a bit of a scandal in Rome, um, because in 54 BC, uh, when they came back to, to Rome, both Rabirius and Gabinius were tried before the Quaestio de Repetundus, um, a tribunal, as you know, that basically judged on the mismanaging, uh, right, the, the corruption, the uh, concussion, like, and in this case for uh, maestas, actually, so for treason, um, the, the the provincial administrators, right, Gabinius specifically was charged for maestas um, for essentially um, having abandoned his province of Syria by intervening in Egypt and plus without an authorization of the Senate. So nobody had conferred him the, um, the imperium for that. This was a sacrilege and uh, the thing was obviously done for, you know, uh, some contingent political uh, interests uh, Pompey was connected with. Now, in 51 BC, um, the Auletes died, and he was uh, succeeded by his daughter, Cleopatra the Seventh. There was a will uh, deposited in Rome together with uh, the treasury um, of Egypt, with which Auletes had bequeathed the kingdom to his um, eldest daughter and the son Ptolemy the uh, Thirteenth, who were essentially to reign together under the guardianship of the Roman people. Uh, it was a fair settlement, right? Uh, there was some money was left just for all the, the dealing. These were his children, um, and uh, the Romans would have had to just to, to take care. I've seen it in, in, of them. I've seen it in different videos that 
you know, put keeping on in uh, in uh, on the throne nominally these uh, dynasts was okay, right? As long as the Romans were basically ruling the country anyway by themselves, uh, so to make the people happy to continue the tradition uh, and so on. Uh, however, again, the, the the situation was was not simply solved, right? Egypt was still uh, severely messed up, um, and before the summer of 49 BC, Cleopatra was in fact removed from the throne by her brother's men. Um, there was a competition, naturally, between the two, uh, and the events of Egypt are uh, now intertwined with a civil war between Caesar and Pompey, notoriously. So, uh, uh, as famously, after the defeat at Pharsalus um, in Thessaly in August 48 BC, uh, Pompey, who uh, had maintained close relations with the Alexandrian court throughout all this time, reached the port of Pelusium uh, and asked Ptolemy XIII for help in the war against his sister. Right, Caesar had crushed the um, Pompeian forces uh, in Greece and essentially um, re re giving support to uh, to Pompey, right, uh, equated to essentially transforming Egypt as a base for operations against Caesar. So what happened, uh, famously enough, is that the king's courtier killed Pompey, right, to make, to make a favor also to, to, to Caesar in the first place, um, and uh, the thing actually being received quite negatively because Pompey was a Roman consul. These people had basically beheaded him just while he was coming uh, off the, the boat. It was actually a Roman uh, centurion that uh, decapitated him. So that was actually the only acceptable death for a Roman beh being beheaded by another Roman citizen. So it was in theory done by, by the book, but it was still an overstep, right? Caesar... Uh, made, uh, like, took revenge of this, in spite of the fact, of course, things were going uh, smooth sailing now. Um, and uh, Caesar needed, at that point, to take control of Egypt as well, right? He uh, reached uh, the, the coast, he landed in Alexandria, um, and in this period of a few months, until the spring of 47 BC, in which he remained uh, in the country, um, things were uh, still uh, troubled as um, the Alexandrian, the famous Alexandrian war described also by, uh, by the Caesar's historiography, um, was endangering the same uh, the same stay, right? So the result, the siege, Caesar escapes by sea and all this, this thing, but um, and that's why he returned to Cyprus. At that point, he had basically being supported by Cleopatra against uh, her, her brother that had staged this. Um, and Cyprus, as we've seen, was a Roman, uh, was, was had been annexated by Rome in 58 BC, um, given it to the uh, Ptolemies uh, in the process. So this was a way to just, of course, Cyprus was going nowhere, but it was a way at least to so I re-established, as we will see, Antony would do similar things, the, the compactness of Egypt, right? It was useful from an administrative point of view to revert to uh, back to that kind of, at least administrative unity, because a fragmented country was more difficult to, to rule, obviously. Now, after um, the death of Ptolemy the, the 13th in 47 BC, um, Cleopatra was confirmed on the throne of Egypt, Right, uh, she was counted among the king's friends and allies of the Roman people. She's an extraordinary figure, as you know. We will talk about her at some point because the sources trace a very interesting profile um, of of this woman, political um, intelligence. Um, and uh, by that point, uh, Cleopatra's uh, son by Caesar, uh, that is the Pharaoh Ptolemy the Fifteenth Caesar. Uh, Caesarion, right, was appointed um, 
uh, as a co-rector, right? Because of course the technically was always the need of a, of a male ruler. Like women in tradition cannot rule in any circumstance, right? So the the, the concept is always about the virile domination. Um, but um, he at that point the word recognized as such. Uh, also after Caesar's death um, by Publius Cornelius Dolabella that was in the east in 43 BC right Dolabella first sided with the Caesar side and had the friend um, he found himself in, in we'll talk about him in some other circumstance um, however the most important thing for Cleopatra w- was to ensure her son's succession to the throne uh, which was complicated in a state of Roman civil war, right after uh, the death of uh, Caesar. Now, after the victory of the um, triumvirs in uh, at Philippi over the Caesar signs in 42 BC, uh, and their so their death, uh, so the um, the establishment of uh, you know this, this spheres of influence. Um, Mark Antony was uh, conferred command of the eastern provinces of Rome. Um, he installed himself uh, essentially in Egypt because it was again the, the better served area uh, logistically, agriculturally, uh, uh, also for for maintaining the troops, but it was crucial. Uh, there were massive. Uh, uh, supplies that could be provided, uh, especially for his uh, expedition against the Parthians, that was a bit like walking in the footsteps of Alexander and Saint Caesar, that had at least died before um, he could make his victorious, um, hopefully victorious, uh, campaign in against this people uh, that harassed, as you know, the essentially the Romans uh, in the east. Right? It's not that they were ever capable of. You know, threatening their presence, but uh, they had killed Crassus, and uh, they were constantly, um, you know, uh, launching raids in in the frontier and so on. So the, the crushing of the Arsacid monarchy, as it would ha- it happen a couple of times historically, um, was a major um, ambition of of the Romans. Now. Uh, it's in this circumstance that Antony meets with Cleopatra in Cilicia, in Tarsus, 41 BC. This region, we will see it, had been historically um, a bit floating, like at least the, the, the Ptolemies at a point had tried to, to control it from, from, from the south, then it had been controlled by the Seleucids, right? So, of course, a recompacted uh, Ptolemaic rule now under Roman control could... You know, would confer the same Egypt this greater reach that uh, had lost in the wars against the Seleucids. Um, Tarsus was a symbolic city because it had also supported Cassius, uh, so it was a way to redeem it and to affirm now that at least Antony, as um, a Caesarian, was um, controlling the land as much as now a new. Uh, dynast in, in the East would um, compared to the previous ones. The link between Mark Antony and Cleopatra is intertwined with the events of the Second Triumvirate, naturally, and uh, with uh, Octavian's uh, skillful anti Antonian propaganda. Right? The concept is that um, Antony passes for a sort of um, Hellenistic Oriental degenerate that is being ruled over by a woman. So everything that could be against the ultra rigidly patriarchal, virile Apollonian, Uranian uh, traditional Roman domination, um, and that um, resonated in Rome uh, importantly. All right. Uh, the truth, though, is that. Uh, Antony and his followers remained true Romans and in many ways again what Antony was doing if anything if I think, was even relatively anachronistic uh, along that path like simply following Caesar's, Caesar's footsteps like uh, Octavian was doing something more than that right he was really changing um, the, 
the entire mankind uh, as a consequence for, for good um, till to our days. In September of 40 BC, the Brindisi Agreement redefined the areas of competence of the triumvirs that were yeah, negotiating from uh, the power of their, their armies. Uh, Octavian had uh, the West, so uh, the, uh, the greater manpower, right, military forces. Uh, Antony had the East, so greater wealth, uh, an astronomic amount of, of, of riches, mostly being invested, in fact, from uh, the Ptolemaic treasury uh, in agreement with Cleopatra. And that's the reason why Antony also needed to, um, let's say, to... to aggrandize themselves also true um true the queen because she you know she she embodied that same uh country's uh power uh, at that point so the one that could uh support finance uh anthony uh for his uh let's say quest for rome let's say um anthony that these were some agreements that redefined some you know, boundaries between the two, uh, Antony, of course, maintained the east uh, from Hellas to Euphrates and uh, proceeded in 37-36 with the reorganization of this enormous amount of territory. Now, the kingdom of Egypt was strengthened as a consequence with new territorial assignment. For example, the principality of Chalcis, the territories of uh, Phoenicia, some regions of Syria, um, the Kilikia Trakeia, right, uh, etc. So again, all done to reinforce this uh, Egyptian the control from Egypt, right, securing the especially most important um, uh, coastal connections, because the, the Silk Road uh, passed through through Syria, through you know had to reach Rome. Um, uh, through Greece and so on. So it was incredibly uh, important. Plus uh, the ultimate goal would be to fight with Octavian at some point in, in the West, uh, which would occur. Um, in 34 BC, after his victory in Armenia, Antony um, proclaimed Cleopatra Queen of Kings on the throne of Egypt and Cyprus, and with her Ptolemy the Fifteenth Caesar as King of Kings, which was a way uh, to to say during a sumptuous ceremony held in Alexandria, by the way, so also you know, in the city of the of the Megas, uh, that uh, Cleopatra was essentially ruling Oper even as a woman with uh, her son, that also embodied the as a pharaoh the Egyptian tradition, of course, but especially also Caesar's one as uh, his son, right? So it it blended you know uh, successfully that again the, the at least the two cultures in as much as uh, Anthony and Cleopatra's destiny were uh, con- uh, now indissolubly intertwined right uh, against uh, Octavian the only chance Cleopatra had at that point to uh, prevent and her reasons are obvious, right? As long as the um, Roman Empire remained split between the East uh, and the West, the center of the East would have been Egypt, right? Whereas with a reunited empire, just there would have been a harsher Roman occupation, not the one that, albeit already existing with Antony's legions, still. Um, was um, uh, that were supplied again with with uh, the Nile Valley's grain uh, were uh, say functional to a government uh, of uh, for uh, for an Egyptian government of this entire east, right? So um, uh, this was really a a matter of uh, enormous uh, risk gamble, right? Cleopatra invested again, astronomic ciphers in, for supporting Antony, and again, there was not much that she could do, but the country itself was, um, uh, say, could um, could trigger some revolts, even within the same Roman establishment. Octavian was uh, trying, of course, to uh, 
yeah, insinuate even this the uh, the sense of again unromanness among the same partisans of his rival. So it was a big deal, right, in a risky situation. In any case, um, through these arrangements, uh, the three sons by, uh, of Cleopatra had uh, been respectively attributed um, the kingdoms of Libya and Cyrenaica, uh, this Cleopatra Selene that, as we've seen, would be eventually marrying with the Mauritanian king later on, uh, Armenia, Media, and uh, the uh, Parthian kingdom to be conquered, yet to Alexander Elias. Um, so, in many ways, also the the most um, you know the most important, the most um, uh, representative uh, of at least in that case of an Anachaemenid legacy, and Phoenicia, Syria, and Cilicia to Ptolemy Philadelphus. Now, these were just um, nominal repartitions. They didn't have any value, but in theory, again, they had been settled for uh, these, um, these descendants. Now, from the second half of the first century BC, uh, naturally, the Roman presence in Egypt increased. There were soldiers, uh, veterans, fundamentally. After all, Caesar had left three legions in Egypt entrusted to a certain Rufio. Um, there were also businessmen, though, uh, such as Publius Candidius Crassus or Quintus Cascellius, depending on the reading of, of the sources, who in 33 uh, BC obtained tax privileges from Cleopatra. There was also the senator uh, Quintus Ovinius, who had directed Cleopatra's wool and textile factories. So definitely the Romans were taking gradually control, in spite of this uh, now unsettled, business between Octavian and Antony of this uh, Egyptian um, uh, economy, economical sectors. Um, and the defeat uh, of Antony and Cleopatra at Actium in September 31 BC uh, and their death uh, the, the following year after the capture of Alexandria, which occurred with a pincer maneuver conducted by Octavian and the um, praefectus Fabrum um, Lucius Cornelius Gallus, uh, the poet remembered by Virgil, uh, led to the incorporation of the Ptolemaic kingdom uh, into the Roman Empire. Right? Um, again, Octavian's success was clamorous, Actium basically disintegrated this uh, enormous fleet plus all the land forces uh, that had been fielded by um, by by Antony in, in Greece um, and uh, basically uh, disgregated any possible any possibility of Egyptian resistance reason for which um, Cleopatra actually tried um, at that point to seduce the same Octavian, which was actually a pretty cold-blooded uh, individual who naturally refused because he had a very sound political intention. The entire war here corresponded, again, to the, the affirmation, essentially, of um, divine power on Earth uh, once for all, and both Cleopatra and Antony uh, were... Now, they didn't have any room in this. They, they both took their lives... Right, actually, uh, Octavian was not particularly happy, especially of, at least Antony had to die at least a true Roman. Right, so even after all the the most beautiful Octavian propaganda, that it is one of the greatest feats of Roman civilization, um, uh, it had finally died like a true Roman would be expected. So there is a, a minimal happy ending, at least as far as Romanity is concerned. Cleopatra, instead, of course, is uh, is doing something different. She actually takes her own life before Octavian um, could display her in triumph in Rome because he had invited her, but you know, not with exactly the, the uh, you know the the intention of making her a great uh, sovereign uh, still. So, uh, also dramatically, the of course this. Uh, the, affirm the full affirmation of Roman rule in, in Egypt uh, occurred, uh, opening, again, uh, Octavian and later Augustus um, 
essentially the greatest amount of wealth that any man had ever had in the history of mankind, right? And proportionally, uh, you know, there would be interesting things, right, to, to be said at least about this. Right? Not even Alexander had had such a thing. It, so the the mere uh, pacification, you know, that uh, the Augustan Empire was spent actually throughout further uh, conquests and uh, taming and well. In fact, the areas that could give a trouble to the richest, more advanced uh, Mediterranean world, and successfully so, um, and so made this this unprecedented amount of resources available to the Romans to leave essentially, as we see, three continents started with some of the greatest, uh, if not actually the greatest. Uh, you know, vestiges um, in the history of mankind. And this stemmed from this, right? And Egypt contributed copiously um, to this uh, phenomenon too, right? The same Rome is uh, adorned still today by several Egyptian obelisks that were in fact shipped through, by the way, very special uh, vessels built to, to, to especially cross the, the sea, right? Not just sailing along the Nile, uh, and that represents the Roman domination of essentially the greatest uh, civilization, at least that uh, the Mediterranean had in, in inside um, had, right? Or had, and with that, all the divine prestige of this, uh, you know, older, also what is considered today occult, but it's actually traditional knowledge um, that was literally the vestiges were literally brought to Rome, right, to, to strengthen further the, um, the regime of the Golden Era. And it's one of the greatest symbols of, you know, Western uh, superiority, if not the, the greatest, at least talking about the obelisk specifically, that you can, as you can still admire them in, in the herbs, um, that are just under everybody's eyes. But, of course, the tourists do not quite understand this little notion and uh, it's just, oh look an obelisk, yeah it kind of brought it for me, but you understand what that actually means, right? We'll make a video about that specifically. Um, so the arrangement of Egypt was implemented by Octavian immediately after the conquest of Alexandria. Uh, this was necessary to consolidate further the situation because even though Antony was dead, and uh, resistance crushed, right? There was no simple, like, uh, say, uh, reality here to manage, because uh, no, no, no power historically is ever simply standing there by doing nothing. Um, we know, um, let's say, not not few about how the the, the Augustan, uh, uh, say, systematic. Uh, settlement of Egypt, let's put it in this way, uh, occurred, it's just that we do not have, for as it's normal, even for these times and places that are very documented, like how it actually happened, right? And we don't know all the, the details. Um, and um, the, um, the, the some hypotheses at least has been, have been discarded, such as for example, the idea that, this, that Egypt would be a private possession of the princeps that actually wouldn't make any sense considering uh, all the Augustan ideology. Uh, there was no such uh, thing to be simply carved like a personal thing. That, you know, it, it, the Imperium was manifested now fully. Um, there was no such hiding. Right? If anything, there was a sort of distribution and more direct control on others. Um, what is unique of Egypt, though, is that the, the province is entrusted to a um, prefect of equestrian rank, famously enough by Octavian, in fact, directly appointed by him, uh, excluding the, uh, the senators from the local government. Right, uh, Lucius Cornelius Gallus, who, as we've seen, had participated in the conquest of Alexandria, figures as the first prefect of Alexandria and of Egypt in the Philae trilingual inscription of April 29 BC in Egyptian, Latin and Greek. The redactio in formam provinciae and the law relating to the internal organization 
of the Egyptian province are believed to date as early as the winter of 30, 29 BC, or shortly after. So uh, Octavian wouldn't lose any time in settling matters uh, locally. Egypt as an imperial province, of course, so um, under the, the, the uh, um, in fact, a prefect uh, uh, directly uh, referring to the to the emperor was uh, to be governed um, even after the division of the provinces between the Senate and Octavian, um, implemented in the famous session of the Senate of thir uh, January the thirteenth. Uh, 27 BC with the Augustan title conferred. Um, security problems probably inspired uh, Augustus to um, to handle Egypt in such a way. Um, uh, in fact, this this aspect that senators, but also illustrious knights, could not enter in Egypt without the authorization of the princeps um, is to be understood. First of all, because of Again, the, the sheer political, uh, economic, and logistical importance of the region. Uh, and the fact that it had been also Mark Antony's base, right? So the echo of the civil wars had not yet died down. Augustus would make uh, a, a masterpiece, to say the least, in essentially establishing through the Ara Pakis, the actual Pax. Uh, Romana and this, you know, uh, rule that would uh, remain and, and touch for for hundreds uh, of years. Um, but uh, imagine it from those who had also been serving under Antony, or at least that had, uh, you know, during the civil wars suffered uh, important damage and so on. So uh, Octavian still had to to settle at the time of the conquest, the matter of, of the veterans were to find the land to uh, to compensate all the, the the hundreds of thousands of Roman men in arms that now required that. So it, it was a very clever move in the first place to avoid any kind of interference uh, in Egypt. Um, in the years that immediately followed the Roman conquest, attention was directed uh, also to the southern frontier. Uh, Lucius Cornelius Gallus fought to put down, for example, a revolt in the Thebaid, so this somewhat southern in fact, uh, part uh, along the Nile, which um, had been in fact difficult to control even in Ptolemaic times with all the dynastic struggles. This was again occurring because it was a land of recent uh, occupation uh, it had been torn by a civil war but just the, the collapse, the defeat of the same countries we've seen uh, at the hands of the same uh, the same Octavian uh, while the prefect Publius Petronius lent between 24 and 22 BC a punitive operation in Ethiopia against the Queen Candace who had occupied the Siena Elephantine and Philae, uh, threatening the same Tabite. The reason why the Ethiopians intervened uh, is that they probably thought that, um, and they were right in part, that Egypt had been destabilized now, that it was at least a, a very large area, and that they were relatively sheltered um, in the south from, say, Rome, at least Roman conquest. But this, however, still hadn't taken into account of the sheer magnitude of power that uh, Octavian, uh, now Augustus, had properly consolidated, and so um, Ethiopia, of course, could not escape uh, some interesting uh, ravages from the sound of the Roman army to show them to, to, that there was really no room for such um, initiatives, right? Uh, this attempt of simply controlling part of the lowest uh, territory close to the cataract uh, with the, the Nile and so uh, etc so what actually happened from there on was a, a fair balance right where naturally the Ethiopians had also an interest in trading with the Romans and vice versa without too many attritions and things would remain fundamentally unaltered uh, Aelius Gallus that was the successor of Lucius Cornelius in the uh, government 
of the province also led in 2524 BC an expedition in Arabia, and specifically in the territory of the Sabaeans, up to the city of Mariba, and this is interesting again because um, this uh, this area could not just support Ethiopia because the Sabaeans in, in the southwest of the Arabian Peninsula, as you know, were essentially the only civilization, right? They had cities, uh, extensive agriculture, dams, the Marib da uh, Dam, in fact, was the um, the most important here that is reached by the same Romans. So it's actually a hell of a uh, also military uh, display uh, and uh, to convince again these populations that there was no way they could interfere with the order established by Rome in, in the region. They are really huge um, spaces right um, and as a consequence Rome uh, uh, was guaranteed um, trade with India through the ports of the Red Sea, specifically Mios Armas, and further uh, south, Berenike, as well. So we're talking about very, very south, right? Uh, very uh, southern locations, uh, and uh, the capacity of control uh, was also uh, present in a, in a Roman naval capacity in the area. Right, because there was warfare actually going on with the Arabs there, but again, nothing that could compete right with the uh, with the with the establishment formed in Egypt right now. Plus, um, there was also a network of caravan routes that led to these various uh, ports uh, uh, by by land. Right, so the military enterprise had surely expansionist purposes. And Rome managed to consolidate all these uh, vital connections, which were, as we were saying before, the essentially uh, the, the the only way to go past the uh, part, at least, of the block that uh, the Parthians could enact throughout uh, Central Asia. In 19 AD, Germanicus stayed in Egypt where he had gone without the permission of Tiberius, thus contravening the provisions of Augustus. This was an extremely grave thing, right? As you know, Julio-Claudians uh, are always depicted uh, negatively, aside from Augustus, right, by the Flavian historiography, so there are always this kind of degenerates that can't be up to Augustus, and anyone who stood against them was a hero for some reason. Uh, Germanicus suffers in this sense also positive press uh, from at least in terms of historical objectivity, but it was surely a way to, you know, uh, that, that was, you know, destabilizing an order that was considered sacred by that point, exactly considering what had happened when uh, the, the civil wars had broken out. Uh, Germanicus visited the, the country, he uh, went up the Nile as far as Elephantine and Sien, and echoes of his stay in Egypt are preserved, in fact, in the same papyri where we are just um, informed of that. A famine struck Alexandria during his stay, right? So what Germanicus did was opening the oriel, that is, where the grain destined for Rome was kept, thus favoring the lowering of, of the price locally, but still, essentially, we don't know to, to which degree or not in practical terms. Um, surely it was seen as a positive thing by the locals, but how much this served Roman purposes is, is debatable. In any case, um, the importance of Egypt that had definitely become by then the fundament fundamental for Rome's grain supply um, is, is notorious, right? So um, Vespasian, for example, acclaimed emperor by the legions of Egypt thanks to the support of the prefect of Egypt, Tiberius Julius Alexander, on July the 1st, 69 AD, uh, stayed um, in Egypt itself until his return to Rome. Uh, it, because from this country, uh, Vespasian could control, in such a dramatic moment, uh, for the succession of the empire, essentially the first uh, civil war, uh, with the sec rapid succession of uh, multiple emperors, saying here, um, the, um, the 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 supply of Rome 
and the legions could be controlled by, by there. So that tells you how delicate this province was, not just in you know thinking of some abstract uh, inconvenience, but literally to the point of determining at least a, you know by great in great part the outcome of that specific successionary crisis, right? So between the 1st and the 2nd century AD, uh, Egypt was the theater of tensions and revolts. Because, um, again, every every country really was, depending on the situation. This doesn't matter how rich and powerful the empire was. We're still talking about pre-industrial times where, uh, say, the surplus is limited um, in uh, relatively to the probably the balance of political uh, subsist subsistency of, of the local community. So, the, uh, the, the of course, the Romans unloaded the burden of their, uh, say, of their expenses uh, on, on the provinces, legitimately. So, I mean, this is something also the British did. Uh, and, and it was a way to still weaken them in favor of a greater central control. Um, and at some point, uh, however, this could, uh, you know, find uh, a way in, in the form of local, uh, have a consequence in the form of local rebellion, right? In 73 AD, for example, after the fall of the Jewish stronghold of Masada, famously enough, where the Romans displayed in full, like, the, like an entire legion to, to besiege this, this fortress with, you know, a ridiculous amount of enemies, but showing the entire Levant, what Rome was willing to do just to crush any revolt. This revolt spread at least to North Africa, because as we've seen, um, the, there were lots of Jewish communities there, but it was also about this um, um, discontent, right, generalized in, in the region. 115 17 was the scene of the great and violent Jewish revolt against the, everybody like the Greeks, the Egyptians, and the Romans. Um, in 172 AD, uh, Abidius Cassius was called to put down the insurrection of the Bucoloi, uh, which is translated in Greek as herdsmen. Right? We do not know exactly who these people were uh, in Egypt, um, whether they had a religious um, uh, connotation or a uh, rural one of the you know some some landowners. Uh, in any case, uh, also this revolt was put down. You understand the weren't here. We're talking about you know fifty year after fifty years, so not really. Uh, again, uh, the Romans knew how to put down revolts because um, they were masters in counter insurrection uh, insurrectional warfare. Um, but you understand that also, at least for what we know, this uh, this region was pretty stable over time. That was also an important Roman goal for the stability of the entire empire uh, in the first place. Uh, uh, Septimius Severus visited Egypt in uh, 199 and 200, and he carried out their significant administrative reforms. Caracalla is mostly remembered for the massacre carried out in Alexandria in 215. In spite of these measures, it's worth remembering that the first Egyptian senator is attested more or less around this time. So it is interesting because you realize that the Romans, of course, were extending their citizenship uh, and uh, gradually, and Caracalla is the one that, uh, with the Constitutio Antoniniana, basically renders any Roman speaker say, Latin speaker as a Roman citizen, um, you know, the, but the, uh, say, the fact that in more than 200 years, no Egyptian had seated in the Senate of Rome that counted uh, hundreds of, of people, like, is still meaningful about the centrality of, say, of Italy, of other provinces, uh, etc. And so the fact that uh, also this sense that Rome was all blended in, was multicultural, it's not quite the same, right? You know, the Romans conquered these areas, they, they subjugated them. 
right? It was not like happening like, oh, okay, well, now the Romans arrive. Everybody's a Roman citizen. Let's join. Let's mix. Let's do whatever. It was actually pretty harsh, um, hierarchical, uh, feudal order in which Rome really, you know, which the, the entire world revolved around Rome in a, in a subordinate uh, position. And the Romans, th this is the, the deepest meaning of the Roman Imperium as, as such, uh, in its also transfiguring capacity. Um, in any case, looking a bit at the history of the 3rd century, um, okay, Egypt played a central role uh, in, in, this, in this phase, right, during the crisis, Etc. Between um, 270 and 272, this is the moment where uh, Zenobia and Vabalatus proclaimed themselves holders of power in Egypt. You know, they were essentially trying to make a sort of, um, you know, the Zoroastrian Hellenistic um, rule in this in these eastern areas, right? But the this the the, the concept still being that. The, they they didn't have much of a power basis. They could exploit the discontent of the Easterners. But once the Rome was recompacted, as it occurred again in 272 under Aurelian, uh, they were crushed and Egypt remained in the control of the Romans. Um, we have already pointed out how much Egypt was um, a, reg um, a province sui generis, right? It was a typical. Uh, in nature, um, however, say the, the the concept being mostly that it was such an Hellenistic place that um, the the structure of the previous kingdom, the local customs, traditions, etc., was were altogether say untouched. Almost there is this idea, but actually, if one looks at it, the incorporation of Egypt into the Roman Empire deeply transformed uh, the country as well. Uh, although uh, the language of the bureaucracy was one of the uh, remained the one of the Hellenic conquerors, the province was administered by Roman officials, um, subjected to Roman taxation and law. Roman soldiers were present in its territory, right? So indeed, yes, the eastern part of the empire is essentially an Hellenistic space. It has a relatively um, uh, superficial Romanization in the deepest cultural sense, but still, the the, the mark remains. Right, uh, Hellenic um, cities such as Alexandria, Naucratis, Ptolemy, and later Antinopolis, that was founded by Hadrian uh, in AD uh, 130, and the site where Antinous had died, as you know, you know the. Uh, his gay lover v v drowned in the Nile. It, it, people say he was probably thrown off the boat on purpose because nobody really likes favorites um, that much. And he was immortalized, you know, because apparently he was quite good looking and all this stuff. But again, Egypt uh, can, you know, take you down uh, as well. Um, and all the cities uh, had their own constitution autonomy uh, in their internal affairs. This was normal by Hellenistic standards. Um, the citizens of the Hellenic polis specifically enjoyed a privileged condition because the Greeks were considered to be superior people to the Egyptians by the same Romans. Um, so uh, this, this was important because, as you understand, the Greeks had also installed themselves historically uh, in the places of power that had come with the Macedons, uh, so uh, it was that Hellas that Alexander brought to rule this greater space. doesn't matter how even they are in a, in a synchrosis, but that yet it, the, the sense that the, the locals were just subjects and that the Greeks were in theory free people, it uh, was very important. Um, just to make an example, not just the Egyptians, but also the Jews were excluded from citizenship. Alexandria, by the time of her foundation, had to have a boule. Uh, there is a, essentially a council, right, and, and, and colleges of elective magistrates. So a bit like what the again the, the normal uh, 
institutions of a polis would be. The Cora, uh, that is, if you want the, the living space, like properly what was given as, like also in Platonic philosophy, like the, the a vacuum in which eventually the spirit had to manifest these powers, was organized into districts known as nomoi, which were uh, within which there were villages uh, and administrative centers, uh, the, the metropolis uh, that uh, Say of, of actually modest urban development, which gradually adopted Hellenic uh, institutions. Um, with um, Septimius Severus, the boule was introduced in the metropolis and returned to Alexandria, which had lost it in the mid second century BC as a consequence of just the uh, dynastic, uh, say, authoritarianism of of the Ptolemy, uh, monarchic, let's say, or, uh, dynastic authoritarianism of the Ptolemies. The um, Roman prefect held meetings uh, to administer uh, justice, as were called the conventus, right? Uh, in the most important centers, of course, uh, Roman justice worked just ad hoc, right? Of course, there were rights, but no state before the 19th century had the capacity of justice being administered equally for everybody right um, of course the the richest had greater power to say the greater problems were the only ones making it to the to the courts they they were generally serious ones about land ownership about internal agitations and things like that so uh, the, the roman justice system was efficient um, for the times being um, but um, the um, let's say of course the itinerancy also of the prefect as far as the centers required his supervision tells you how much the entire pre-contemporary world was about mob right from the most remote villages at the corners of civilization to, to these Hellenistic metropolis what you have is Again, the communities administer themselves by themselves, largely, and just when there are problems that cannot be resolved, uh, just they, they, there is somebody else, some higher authority called, right, to judge, to arbiter, because otherwise there are some pre-existing rights that uh, doesn't matter how restrained as they are, de facto under Roman co domination, right, so not really, you know, uh, affording these communities who knows which room and maneuver but still right internally and because it was a bit like their microspace right the, the polis was considered uh, while well, the romans considered the, the ecumenic nature of their their power the, the, the greeks thought of them just living within the Hellenic world um well the rest being barbaric in nature now um the, these conventus were the following. Um, so in Alexandria in June, July, in Pelusium in January, Memphis in late January, April, and occasionally at Arsinoi, Antinopolis, and at Coptos. So this depended of naturally, like, I don't know, the fairs, things like that, you know, during the, the year were some better moments in which... Uh, just the local customs, traditions, administration were more conveniently assisted by Roman justice. Uh, the Roman prefect of Egypt was also in command of the legions stationed in the province, which were reduced in 23 AD from 3 to 2. Again, the land was fairly easy to control. Like uh, It's basically just the Nile Valley that counts. Um, the, the surrounding neighbors are relatively yeah uh, in say incapable of procuring significant uh uh damage right just you have to control the the king the, the province in ex, in its uh, latitudinal extent because uh from alexandria to the first cataracts there are 1000 kilometers uh as the crow flies which means with the means of communication at the time uh, across the, the Nile, uh, essentially 1,000 miles, and you have to make a Roman uh, deterrence felt uh, substantially uh, downwards uh, there. And the two legions stationed in Egypt were the Legio Tertia Cyrenaica, uh, 
and the um, Legio duo at the Casima dei Otariana. Uh, both stationed, however, in Nicopolis near Alexandria. Again, this was because of just the the presence of the two for a while would last, right? Even if uh, uh, moved somewhere else. Uh, in 119, the Legio Tertia Curenaica is transferred from the province and replaced in 127 and 128 AD um, from the uh, by by the Legio Secunda Traiana. Well, the traces of the 22nd are lost, right? The the command of the legions was in Egypt. This is also interesting. Entrusted to the Equites, to the knights, uh, which adds a bit more, of, you know, uh, boldness in theory, right? To, 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 you know, to this guy's command. Um, military diplomas testify the auxiliary troops present in Egypt, usually from three to four, were over time the cavalry ally, while from seven to ten the cortes, and you know, these were smaller units compared to the legions, uh, so they they also varied, uh, say, uh, in uh, in number more easily than the former. Um, it's, again, w what, what it takes. Rome, uh, as we've seen, has is uh, reasoning m in minimally, right? It's not thinking at this time to be on the defensive. Uh, these forces are stationed... Uh, to, in theory, to, to project dramatically beyond the, the frontiers, uh, you know, we're a completely aggressive, expansionistic, offensive mentality. In fact, their purpose is not much controlling the locals, it's properly deterring the outer side. And that's how far the Roman Imperium actually went. It would be interesting to draw a map of that if, if we could, but it's also a matter of, you know, floating. Uh, 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 power over time. Um, when we look at the ethnic background of the soldiers um, uh, sir, in service in Egypt, we, um, re of course, we, we can uh, look at a gradual trend of local enlistment. Uh, it's also, we can do this, importantly, because the, the papyri mostly survive, at least in uh, survived more than other in, the, in other places because of the dry weather and all this is quite famous in the east and in Egypt especially uh, also because it was a very large country so it was very densely inhabited and uh, there is just more uh, documents surviving the fleet that is the classis Alexandrina so the the Alexandrine fleet um, completed the military garrison of Egypt uh, because uh, historically we've seen it in other videos about Egyptian uh, warfare. Uh, uh, of course, moving across the Nile was the most important thing, even in terms of making the the armies move and being supplied across the, uh, along the river, right? And uh, essentially, uh, most of the, let's say the most important centers being in, uh, along the same banks, so uh, it was easy. To control the province exactly for this reason, but you needed a fleet to do that. Aux auxiliary units that were the ones you would attrition the most, and as it was normal in in the Roman army, were stationed in the south of the country. I always remember this. Uh, the the auxiliaries were so the local peoples were paying a congress amount of blood, uh, also a pretty heavy one respectively, for Rome. Right, because Rome had the upper hand on them, and so she could afford that. Um, they were these this troops were stationed in the south of the country, so in the region of Sien and Philae. Uh, others manned the routes leading to the ports of the Red Sea across the the mountainous interland in the east. Um, this is also quite important because there were some tribes living in in those places. Right in the third century, would also rebel. Right, so. It, uh, yes, they are some some semi-desertic areas, but they are still inhabited, right? If there is a crisis, these people launch raids, whatever. So you need to escort the currents, you need to um, secure the roads in the first place, um, and just to see that there is a military presence for which you can't do whatever you want. 
Uh, the territory between the Nile and the Red Sea especially was of great economic importance, also because of the rich mineral resources you could find there. For example, the porphyry quarries of um, what was known as Mons Porphyritas and the so-called Forum uh, Granite of Mons Claudianus, where you can still look archaeologically at as a, the camp, etc., um, in, in fact, a strong presence of military garrisons is documented in this area. Because it was easy there just to take relatively cut off from civilization to, to suffer attacks from brigands, from this, the nomads of the surrounding Arabian desert and so on. Um, so, again, nothing to be... Especially in early imperial times, it was not a single people that threatened Rome, the, the, say the Roman Empire uh, as a whole. Um, the best being the Parthians, so you can imagine uh, what I'm talking about. Um, and it, in in this uh, picture, of course, the the protection of some strategic sectors were still the the guarantee of a, of a stable government as we as we have observed. Um, so this was, generally speaking, the, the outlook. Uh, I haven't inserted a very short introduction in this video because at, at a point it's redundant, right? But um, it's also because we talk a bit less about Roman times, so maybe this is a good chance to, to do it. Um, for today, however, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.